Welcome to the next mini lecture. The topic today is style. Uh, we are going to split this lecture into two parts. Uh, so we will talk about part one, uh, discussing style. And our, now in our last mini lecture, we discussed the importance of introductions and conclusions. And we looked at the function of both an introduction to preview what we're going to talk about and a conclusion to review and remind the audience what we've said. We looked at the individual elements of each, the attention getter, listener relevance link, credibility statement, thesis and main point preview, and an introduction. And we also looked at the three elements of an effective conclusion um, to restate our thesis, to restate our main points, and to come up with a clincher. Uh, leave them on a high note. Now, um, today we're going to switch our focus uh, to the canon of style. Uh, we started off the course talking about Aristotle's five canons, and style is certainly one of them. Now, more specifically, we're going to discuss the elements of style in an oral presentation, followed by an analysis of, uh, of a short speech. Well, you're actually going to perform the analysis in the written assignment number seven, and we're going to talk about it here today. Uh, now, certainly uh, in our society, I think we tend to put a premium on delivery. Uh, we'd rather have a poorly constructed speech delivered well than, uh, than the opposite, a great, uh, nicely written speech delivered poorly. Uh, style is important. Let's define style. It's the linguistic choices that we make in a speech. It's the words. Those are our tools. And good style features three elements. Clarity, um, the ability to arouse emotion, and the ability to foster inclusion. Uh, so uh, let's go through these elements, each one of them. Uh, clarity first. Uh, clarity simply is your ability to be clear, to make the audience understand, not to obscure them and to use them. And there are several subsets of clarity uh, which we'll talk about. Generally speaking, in an oral presentation, the language that you use is more simple, more concrete, more direct. It tends to use uh, more familiar words, uh, more personal pronouns, and more contractions. You don't want to use $5 words when you can use a 50 cent word and, um, and, and derive the same meaning because you don't want to lose your audience. There's no rewind, there's no TiVo. If you lose, if you confuse them, you lose them. So clarity is extremely Im important. Um, in trying to generate clear language, we want to also talk about vivid and descriptive language. Now, vivid and descriptive language paints word pictures, and these are our tools as a speaker. One way to develop this is to employ sensory language, the language of the senses, what it smells like, what it, what it sounds like, what it tastes like, uh, what it feels like. Um, imagine if I asked you to write about what your favorite place is, and you only had sensory language to describe that. Uh, what does this place feel like? What does it smell like? What does it taste like? Well, maybe it's the beach and you're talking about the feeling of the sand underneath your toes or the particular salt air or what it's your favorite recipe from your grandmother smells like in the kitchen. These are things that add depth uh, to, to a speech and they add color. And this is what we're striving for when we want vivid language. We also want to have accurate language. We want to control our word choices. I'll throw out two terms. Uh, denotative and connotative. These are the meanings that words have. Now, de denotative meanings are the dictionary definition of a word, and connotative meanings are the, the, the meanings that words have for different groups of people. Most, most words in the U.S. language have connotative meanings. That is, they have positive meanings, negative meanings, and neutral meanings. Even words, simple words, that you would think that we would all have the same meaning, like justice or freedom, um, are terms that have meanings to all different parts of our society, and they're very different. If I were to throw out uh, the word feminist and asked you the first thing that came to your mind, or the word divorce and the first thing that came to your mind, I'm sure each one of you would have very different uh, meanings associated with those words. So it's important to be accurate, in other words, using the words that you want to use, when you want to use them, and how you want to use them, and to a particular audience so that you control uh, the meanings uh, of the words as best as possible. So being vivid and descriptive uh, are all part and, and accurate are part of the aspect of clarity, a part of style. Uh, it helps the audience to understand. Another important aspect of style is the ability to uh, arouse emotion in an audience. Now, uh, we're in the political season here, and I'm a bit of a political junkie, so I've been following the campaign very closely. 
And if you followed the last election, we know that President Obama was accused of inspiring his audience. Yes, candidate Obama tapped in to audiences' emotions, such as hope and optimism. And regardless of your political stance, we as listeners tend to pay attention to things that we're emotionally invested in. Um, we talked about pathos and the ability to invite an audience to respond in a particular fashion. And this involves understanding their needs. We talked a little bit earlier about unmet needs, that everybody in our audience has some unmet need, and it's up to us to sort of tap into that. Um, those can be things such as fear or security or humor, but it's an emotional appeal designed to hit them where they live. Um, I always like to think of country music. It's funny, we never think of that, but a good country music is, is about pathos. Uh, you know, it, it, a good country song has to have some heartache, a, a pickup truck, and a dog. Uh, all basic human needs, well, you know, for most of us. Now, while clarity helps the audience to understand and arousing emotions uh, addresses their need, a good speech also has to contain inclusive language. Now, inclusion goes back to the basic rule of being audience-centered and goal-oriented. And it's an extension of useful audience analysis, being aware of all the members of the, your audience. We want to avoid biased language. Um, what type of language would you use if you were selling you know, men's cologne to a mixed audience? You wouldn't just address men. You'd want to address women, too. After all, they're the consumers of this product, and they're generally buying it for you. So it has to be of interest to them. Because if not, we exclude half of our audience. Uh, one way to become what we call consubstantial with an audience is using words like we and, and, uh, and us versus I and me. As I say, there's no I in team, and using we and us is inclusive by nature. So, we've discussed uh, what style is and a few elements of effective style. When we come back in part two, um, we're going to uh, look briefly ahead at an uh, upcoming assignment and I'm going to talk about a few rhetorical devices that help to promote good style in a speech.